Okay, folks, welcome to Meet the Beekeeper for Monday evening, July 6th. And just a reminder of where we are geographically, we're just uh, south of a huge thunderstorm here uh, in uh, east of Edmonton. Um, I guess number one is, is that we uh, folks can hear, it's really important. And we're just coming up to eight o'clock, so we're going to get let uh, some more folks join, and then uh, we'll get going. But just uh, a quick weather update for the sake of the recording, so that it's there when we replay this. Um, we were last together two weeks ago, Monday, today, two weeks today, and um, we didn't really have a lot going on as far as honey flow is concerned, and uh, two weeks later, we've got um, a bit of a report of poor weather, uh, wet, poor weather. A few nice days interspersed here and there. Um, but today uh, was really the first day that we've seen the bees actively leave the hive and go and get uh, nearly six pounds of nectar, uh, predominantly nectar. So uh, this is again July the 6th just east of Edmonton. Uh, we are just south here, a very large thunderstorm. There's no rain yet, but if so, I've made arrangements to quickly go under a little shelter that we have over to my left here. So tonight, uh, we want to just discuss again, uh, for, we're just going to start here with the overwintered colony. And um, the, uh, the, the overwintered colony uh, in the two-story box, <clears throat> Um, we've had an opportunity to look at the hive scale. Now, for those of you who don't know what a hive scale is, is this hive here is actually sitting on a hive scale. Um, it's not very easy to tell in the video. If I just actually lower it down ever so slightly, you can see that this guy is actually up off the ground. He's on there. Uh, he's on a brick. And then we've got the hive scale, stainless steel platform, and then we've got the screen bottom board. And um, the reason that we discussed that uh, just quickly with you is because um, for those of you who are new into beekeeping, beekeeping is a big investment. And um, what's going on inside of your hive is a bit like a new baby, a premature baby. Um, the, the entire focus of the family and the doctor and the hospital team is to get the babies to grow, to increase in weight. So growth really is being measured by an increase in weight in kilograms or pounds or whatever you prefer. And I liken that to a beehive because if you have a hive scale, and I know uh, the hive scale that we sell here at Hive World <clears throat> might seem a little pricey, but it is in the long run a very, very cost-effective investment to give you a very quick download of information so that you can take action to preserve and keep your bees alive. Uh, because this time of the year, what we want to see is we want to see increase. We want to see daily increases of 25 pounds if possible. Um, now that's nectar. It's not honey. It's nectar. But the right size colony in the right location with the right amount of flowers available with the correct number of bees is going to bring a surplus honey crop, especially for those of you who have got overwintered double hives now. Those of you who are still establishing nucleuses, your honey flow is going to come in a couple of weeks like uh, my two here on the left and right, which we'll show you shortly. So we're taking a look at the higher scale, and really the last uh, two weeks we've had rain, not great weather at all. Uh, but the bees seem to be doing really well. Um, the temperature sensor inside the hive tells us that the temperature has remained absolutely constant at 34.5 degrees ever since the 15th of May. That, mean, that means that we know the queen has had there have been absolutely zero interruption in laying because the moment the queen stops laying, the temperature of the brood nest dips by two degrees. Now, these might seem really complicated things to discuss to uh, hobbyist beekeepers, but I'd really like to impress on you how, um, how much we try to avoid those conversations with customers uh, or phone calls where your know, clients are really upset that they've lost their bees. 
Um, and I, and you know, not having any sort of a high scale product uh, is a bit like flying blind in a storm. You know, where are we actually going here? My bees seem to be doing okay. We can look inside. Sure, we can look inside pretty regular to see what's going on. But it doesn't really tell us how successful the bees are in increasing the overall weight of the hive. Because an increase in weight in the hive in the spring tells us they're gathering enough to create brood. An increase in the summer, when we have two boxes full of bees, tells us that we know for sure that the bees are doing well um, with uh, the honey flow. Um, and then a very appropriate gradual decrease in the uh, over the fall and the winter which tells us that the bees are consuming the uh, honey properly irregardless of the exterior temperature so um this is a little report from just east of edmonton uh the 6th of july not the not exactly the greatest uh report unfortunately uh really 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 w uh, wet weather and of course wet weather renders the blooms useless uh, alfalfa needs 14 hours of sunshine after a rainstorm to begin secreting nectar sufficient for the bees to be attracted to it. Uh, we only need five or six hours of sunshine for the canola, it's, it's less. Uh, and then similarly for the white clover, which many of you will be very familiar with. So two weeks ago, we put on a medium box. Now, I want to just talk to you folks a little bit about medium box. So here we have uh, a deep box of brood and a second deep box of brood. And these two are full. And then on the top here, two weeks ago, without, without an excluder, we put on uh, a medium box. Now, one of the things that we're coming to learn um, as we do more experiments is that... Um, when the bees are in two deep boxes for brood, when you put on a, a fir the first uh, box here for a honey without an excluder and it's a medium box, the queen and the bees are very reluctant to make this new space part of the brood nest. Now we're learning more about this, um, but it's to do with symmetry and uh, geometry. Um, for the bees to increase the brood nest from an area looks like here, to an area that looks like here um, is not is not it's just not how the bees operate. They need the depth of these frames to operate on, with no break, to make it their home and their broodness. When we add a medium box, we're actually only adding seven, really seven usable inches, and the bees uh, tend to prefer that <clears throat> and take to it very quickly for uh, surplus honey, surplus honey storage. So I'm going to give you a little look here at uh, what we've got inside this hive uh, on the top box. It's been on for two weeks now. And in the two weeks, we've had approximately uh, a 15 pound gain on this hive, which would be predominantly nectar. Now, you notice again, I'm not using smoke because this is a not really a great time to be going into a hive in the first place with the uh, thunderstorm coming. And um, if I look down here, I basically see no production whatsoever. Now, for those of you who are newer, don't worry if you see this. The bees aren't working on it. Because there just isn't a surplus nectar to store away. They're, they're using it. You can see we've got a lovely box of bees. And the bees have begun working on this box very significantly. But the brace comes between the boxes here is empty of honey. Well, there's a little bit there that I've broken. But um, I'm sure you can see here how um, lovely and full this box of bees is. And then underneath here, you can see we've got some nice white wax developing. What we'll do now is we'll just lower this and put this back. And we'll just go in here and take a look at some of these frames they're working on. And you can see that the bees have just begun to start drawing out a very small patch of the frame. I'm 
Let's bring this a little closer so you can see. You can see whether bees are clustered there is where they're actually is where they're actually working. But most importantly, again, is no brood. They definitely seem happy enough. There is a little honey in the brace comb between the boxes and the frames, but we don't really have, uh, in two weeks, we don't really have any production. Apart from the fact that we can start to see some little bits of white wax here, here and there. Okay, so that's our uh, two box wintered col overwintered colony. Now, um, at the front of the hive, again, we don't have the entrance reducer on. Not on a two box hive, not on 20 frames of bees. And we don't have on any sort of mouse guard or anything like that. And the reason we don't have those things on right now is because the colony is um, quite large enough to uh, to fend for itself. I'm just going to move along here to our next colony. And uh, if you recall, this is this colony was a um, single box colony that we dropped down here about three weeks ago, and then two weeks ago we added the second box. <coughs> now. Um, I will comment that the bees were actually very, very quiet just now, which tells me that they've got a nice, a nice amount of honey in there. Because when they're quiet in the summer, you can be pretty confident that they've started to build um, and start to store away surplus honey in the brood nest. Now, this colony here uh, had a new box put on top. And I'm just going to take out one of the frames here and show you that really in two weeks, folks, don't really have a lot to show. Um, we're not feeding this colony because it did have very good stores, and there have been some decent flying. Um, not decent flying enough for honey, but there have been some... I guess I'm placing a bit of an objection to me being out here tonight. But um, on here you, can, you can't really see that there's just too much production at all. Now, what we decided here is because the queen is not up here, and has not begun to lay. We're actually going to take off this box tonight, and we're going to put on our um, auto extract. Now, for those of you who are wintering bees in uh, Alberta, it would be important for you to leave your second box on, because it's important to make sure that you've got enough bees um, in two boxes to overwinter properly. But this particular colony is going to be going in two. Uh, onto a, a pallet in the fall and it will go down to Vancouver for the winter. So we actually can use this particular colony to demonstrate to you how we use the um, auto extract system. Now, many of you have purchased the auto extract system and here it is. I'll just set it on top here. So I'm just going to set it the wrong way around so that we can discuss it for a minute. As many of you will be familiar with, it has the um, movable. It's still stuck a little bit from last year's propolis. There we go. Okay, so this this is back to front. <clears throat> um, just to give you an example of what we're doing here, I'll turn it around before we uh, before we go uh, tonight. But basically, the bees build the honey into these plastic frames and uh, you're able to remove these um, holes and uh, remove these, put the key in and have the honey dispensed out of these little holes here and to the jar or bucket or whatever system you're using. Um, it's a great product and I know many of you are using it, but basically second box needs to look like this here 
before you put on your auto extract super because basically anything that's going to be surplus now from downstairs is just going to come straight upstairs into the auto extract. Now, again, folks, we're putting this on as a second box because this hive is going to either be wintered uh, indoors in Alberta or it's going to be going down to the Fraser Valley for one of our overwintered hives to go into pollination next spring. So we don't need the second box full of honey for these guys to make it through the winter because we only need a single brew box for our wintering method. So if your second box, if you're in Alberta and your second box looks like what we just showed you there, you can now put on your auto extract. Now you'll also notice that I did not put on the queen excluder. Now, if you're a queen excluder person, um, one of the things about the Hive World Auto Extract box is that it doesn't actually need to have um, it doesn't actually need to have the excluder because the queen won't lay typically in those cells anyway. If you are a, if you are a, if you are a, person that likes to use the queen excluders, then I'm not against that. Um, but what you want to do is put this auto extract box on first, allow the, bee, the bees to begin building on it and drawing out some of the wax, then take it off two weeks later and uh, take it off two weeks later and um, shake, the bees out, shake the bees out, put the um, Put the uh, excluder on and put the um, auto extract back on so you know for sure that the uh, queen is not in there. And I'm basically just shaking all the bees out here that were in my top box just hanging out. tremendous army of bees going in um, is really the kind of numbers that we're looking for to bring in that surplus honey crop. Okay, so there we've added uh, we're taking a look at our medium box for honey production on our overwintered colony. And we've taken a look at uh, another hive uh, and seen that it's ready for an auto extract box. And um, we'll come back in a week uh, with you guys on uh, YouTube. And we'll take a look, see what kind of production we've got, take a look at the hive scale that we have. Now, for those of you who have established a new nucleus this spring, uh, we'll just bring you back over to our little nucleus box, our, our eight frame hive, and we'll take a look inside and see how the queen's doing, and, uh, and try and answer a few questions before we sign off for the evening. Now, we're hearing a lot of reports of uh, choke brood. Choke brood is a, is, a, is, a, is a bacterial infection that affects the brood before it's hatched, and um, it's, it's common, folks, it's common especially when there's nectar delinquency. Now, nectar delinquency is when there's not enough nectar coming into the hive to satisfy the operational requirements of the bees. Uh, in addition to that, if they're put under stress with bad weather and they're confined to the hive, you're gonna find that that's the perfect situation for chalk brood uh, to break out in your hive. So, uh, 
the the bees will bring out the little bit of chalk brood uh, and they'll deposit they deposit it out the front of the hive. It can, can look a little alarming, but it, uh, the bees will recover. They'll 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 get over it. <clears throat> um, but uh, depending on what kind of a season we have and when we have those seasons um, in the spring and the early summer, it's it's common. It's common and it's it's hard to manage. Uh, we've got to keep strong beehives. That's, that's the one way to manage them. We keep strong beehives, and we keep the feeders on through the wet periods. We can be sure that we can get around the difficulties of uh, chalk brood. Okay, so we'll open up here and take a look inside our eight-frame hive that we established. Uh, many of you remember we established from a nucleus. And again, in two weeks, um, we haven't fed this hive to simply demonstrate uh, what can happen and how slow things can be when we don't necessarily uh, feed the bees. And so we'll just go in here from the outside, and you can see really that we've got two frames there, not really worked on at all. And we come to the third frame, and the bees are cleaning it, but it's really exactly like it was when we put it in there. Basically, three weeks ago, the bees again are cleaning up this third, fourth frame. Um, I don't see any eggs. I also got some new glasses. Apparently, I'm getting more and more short sighted. I got some new glasses since I was doing this the last time, and I can see the frames even better. But, um, Again, it's the fifth frame. Bees are just hanging out. Not really any production whatsoever. Bees are not really utilizing it. And then here we have the uh, sixth frame. And we have nectar. So quite a bit of uh, new nectar getting stored above the brood nest. And then we have the... Finally here we have the seventh and the eighth frame. And really it's been used for a little bit of nectar storage, but nothing serious, folks. This is not really, um, the last two, three weeks of bees has not been great. Uh, but what we do have downstairs is a, is a really, really good box of bees. Uh, as you can well see. I hope. And I'll just um, knock it down here a little bit. So we'll just take a look from the outside. Maybe we need to move some of these frames around to get the uh, queen to lay in some more frames. Nice pollen frame. Basically 100% empty. And we've got a new frame here which we don't exactly seem to have been rushing to fill. No, they started a little bit at the top here, but nothing really serious. And then we've got one of the original. One of the original frames of the nucleus. It's got a queen cup on it. So this is a really good example, folks, of a queen cup. So if you see these, don't be alarmed. This is not swarming. This is just a bees insurance program to make sure they've got some little structure ready to guide the queen to if they suddenly decide that they want to have um, a new queen. So that's called a queen cell. Uh, sorry, that's called a queen cup. If you have those, they're not queen cells. And in fact, if you look on the back of the frame here, we have another one. So it's just um, it's just prudent, uh, it's just sort of a prudent thing that the bees do. And now we're looking here basically at the uh, original five frames of the nucleus. We've got some building going on, but it's not exactly the most structural. Um, Bees seem a bit reluctant to draw out too much. And we've got the uh, brood hatching. And I see the queen, there she is, busying herself. Oh, and here we go. So we've got a queen, but folks, we've got a super siege cell here. An absolutely gorgeous supersedure cell. And the reason that we know that it's a supersedure cell 
um, is because uh, the reason we know it's a super procedure cell is because the bees are crowding over it because they've taken it out of the hive. It's because it's all by itself. There is one beside it here, but it's not capped yet. This lovely peanut shaped cell here is called a super procedure cell. The, the bees have decided she's inferior. Now, I don't know. I don't know what the definition of that is. Um, but you can see how it's all alone, uh, apart from this one little one beside it. But basically, it's all alone in the center of the frame, surrounded by predominantly cat brood. So if you have one of those in your hive, I'm looking on the back here and I don't see any more. The queen was on this. Uh, on this frame. Let's just come on this side now. Let's take a look. But if you do have a super procedure cell like that, uh, you know, very large and very obvious, now don't panic. The bees are replacing the queen, but they're replacing her at the same time that she's laying. So with super procedure, there's very, it's very rare. There is a, any particular break in the laying pattern, maybe a day or two. Uh, often the often the uh, queen that's being superseded is not necessarily removed before the other queen is dispatched. So uh, don't worry too much about uh, the procedure. Okay, now we've got some good eggs again. Yeah, so she is laying. She's laying really well, but uh, bees have definitely decided that uh, for whatever reason she's going to be replaced. Another really good frame of cat brood. Another really good frame of <coughs> hatching brood. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to help them out here with a little bit of a uh, drawn comb. Um, I'll put this guy back in. On the outside, and we'll drop in one of these drawn frames. And then we'll drop another drawn frame in the center here. Just in the room. There we go. No worries at all about the. Uh, your procedure cell. It will hatch and uh, the queen will often fly and uh, mate and come back and then kill her mother. You don't, uh, you don't really have any break in the laying cycle and many, many, many uh, beekeepers will have um, super procedure in spring and not even be aware of it because it's so quick and the bees do it so effectively. And often because there's no break in the laying cycle, um, it's just, it's not noticed. So we'll just reassemble these frames back in the top box. There is a tremendous amount of brood down there, so we do know the bees are going to need this box pretty quick here. With a lovely smell of fresh pollen. So there we go. July the 6th, what the uh, nucleus looks like, what the size we're talking about. You have a winter colony and then a single brood box. Just uh, right at the very beginning here, the main nectar flow in Alberta. Thanks, folks, for joining us and uh, look forward to catching up with you next week and seeing some, hopefully, some decent progress. Get on my uh, there we go. My box on straight here. All right, if you have questions, type away and uh, see what we can do to what we can do to help you out.
Okay. Okay, so we'll go back to the top, folks, and um, we have a question from Anton who says, when I collect pollen, should I close the upper entrance, the one for ventilation? Um, so if the bees are tending to use that because they realize it's easier, then uh, we'd recommend closing it, yeah. That, that would be fine. Um, but certainly don't collect pollen to the point where it's... Um, um, uh, um, how do I say this? Uh, don't you don't collect pollen to the point that it's detrimental to the bee's growth and development. Um, some beekeepers use only the inner cover, even in the early spring, but others use the one with metal with no ventilation. So, uh, not really sure how to answer the question, but what I can tell you is, is that for migratory beekeepers and commercial beekeepers, there are a number of um, there are a number of methods employed. Um, they're not necessarily all correct um, or all the best. But um, w what I would say is, is that um, if you're a migratory beekeeper and your bees are, tend to be kept indoors or in a different climate than Alberta in the winter time, then you can afford to not use any in the cover and you can just use a lid straight on top of the bees. Um, Anton also asked, how do you preserve the hives from moth? So uh, you can use moth balls, which is a really good option, or else you can also um, uh, use screens. So if you have a real big problem, make some rims that are the same dimensions as a super box and put on uh, rims, uh, put on screen, and then stack your supers on top of those screens and then put one on the top and then use a ratchet strap to ratchet it all together so the moth can't get in there. And Willie asked a really good question. He says, is it bad for the bees when the farmer sprays canola field against weeds and fungus? Yeah, so um, it just depends what is being sprayed, Willie. But typically speaking, if it is indeed um, the the fungus and the weeds, uh, you can be assured that the government, for the most part, in most areas of the country, have outlawed anything that is harmful to bees. Now, harmful to the bees in the sense that the farmer sprays the flower, the product dries on the flower, and the next morning the bees come out and they go to the flower and unfortunately they take poisoned nectar. Now none of those products that like that are actually available to farmers in Alberta, BC or anywhere in Canada. Anything that's going to poison bees after they've sprayed the crop is not going to affect the, is, is not allowed. What we do know is, is, that, is that when the bees fly through on a, on, a, on, a, on a nice day when the farmer's spraying, if the bees fly through that spray, they'll die. And we've already had that in a couple of our locations. We know for a fact that the bees are not being poisoned by visiting poison flowers. They were indeed killed by being exposed to a fungicide or a herbicide in flight. Um, Brenda asks, uh, split an overwintered hive on May the 19th, a new developed chalk brood and original hive had none. Why and how does this happen? So you may have, uh, you may have, you may have been listening earlier, uh, Brenda, I'm not sure, but we spoke about chalk brood. So chalk brood is, um, it's got to do with nectar deficiency. Now in a nucleus, there's a lot less bees to collect the necessary nectar to gather for the daily needs of the nucleus. And if the bees are put under, under stress with nectar deficient, uh, deficiency, as well as, as well as very poor weather, which we've been having, um, some sort of an outbreak of chalk brood is, is uh, expected. We can rectify that by immediately feeding and uh, hopefully getting some decent days that the bees can fly and do better. Okay, uh, also the original hive swarmed today, even though I gave the original hive a honey super on May 25th and July 2nd, honey super on July 2nd. Swarms captures, why did it swarm? So, um, I'm not sure if you put uh, a honey super on that was just foundation, 
But if it was just sheep to foundation and it wasn't drawn comb, um, the bees see that as actually a blockage. They don't see that as additional room. If it had been built out comb, uh, that would have been different. When anybody's adding a honey box that's got just foundation in it, folks, you need to draw up some uh, frames from the second box up into the third box, or the box below, I should say. Bring it up and um, into space, br uh, built out frames with new frames. Otherwise, the bees, the bees just need that encouragement to start to draw them out. Um, so again, on the swarming, um, <clears throat> we're just entering, uh, July, basically the beginning of July when the canola flowers, we enter our second swarm season. And the reason for that is because the chemical buildup that the bees gather, uh, the nutrition, the nutritional benefit, uh, chemical buildup in the bees and the bees bodies and the hive, um, uh, with canola specifically tends to trigger Swarming if there's not sufficient room for the bees. And sufficient room is described as drawn comb. So if you're adding a box, a second box, or a third box, or a fourth box, or a fifth box, and it has foundation in it, the bees don't see that as more room. They see it as a blockage because there's a whole bunch of work to do now. And they need to use the resources of gathering honey as well as um, the surplus honey they can bring in to actually create a surplus honey crop that they can put aside from themselves. So uh, many times we find that the um, hives will swarm even with boxes above them because often they're foundation. Uh, Matt asks, when a hive supersedes its queen, does the hive swarm with the old queen or does she leave alone and get killed? So she gets killed typically she gets killed after her daughter has mated and returned to the hive and has begun laying for a few days. It's called mother-daughter. It's very common. But no, the hive does not swarm with supersedure. Um, uh, Matthew asks, what if I see royal jelly at the bottom of a queen cup? Is it still not a swarm in the making? Um... It sounds to me, uh, well, so royal jelly in the bottom of a queen cup has nothing to do with swarming. It has to do with queen production. Um, now, what I would say is, is if you have in, is in a condition where you have no eggs and you have no larvae, um, it may not necessarily be a swarm. It may be um, emergency replacement of the queen. And a lot of people get very mixed up between emergency replacement of a queen and um, Swarming, because after you come back to your hive and your swarm has left, you you have what looks like a bunch of emergency cells, and many of them may have, may have hatched. And when you look inside, you can see the residual royal jelly that bees have not eaten yet. Uh, but that can happen in a circumstance of um, swarming or emergency queen production. Uh, Matt also asked when you spoke about feeding the hive. So really, if we have more than 24 hours or 48 hours where the bees cannot fly uh, with wet weather, um, to have a feeder available for them is really important. It will, it will get you through that and it will reduce the stress on the bees. Um, so we're talking like um, a one or two gallon pail inverted on top of the hive um, being fed down through the, um, through the hole in the inner cover. Um, thank you, Savannah. Uh, the bees do make great supersedure cells. They're they're, uh, <laughs> they're always perfect. The supersedure cells. They've been uh, babied by many thousands of bees. Um, uh, Marvin, we don't use drone comb. No, uh, we don't have. We do have some drone comb. Obviously, the bees uh, make it, but we don't have any additional drone comb uh, in the hive. Uh, Matthew asks, why would you not split this hive if they're trying to do super procedure? Uh, you wouldn't split the hive that's trying to do super procedure because um, it's not, they're not making a queen cell because they're too big. 
they're uh, they're making a queen spell because the bees have decided that the queen is inferior, and um, basically that that hive is just going to continue to develop. But the top box isn't full yet. And we want to overwinter this one here in place, so um, we would leave it like that, and we would um, let the new queen hatch, dispatch the old queen. Um, with a supersedure situation, the bees can tell very, very, very minute things about the queen that we can't discern. And if you knock off that supersedure cell, you can be guaranteed that the queen, the bees, will replace it within 48 to 72 hours. Because once they've been made up their mind to supersede the existing queen, it's very hard to dissuade them. Uh, Anton asks about spraying with chemicals. So I don't believe, uh, it's my understanding and from my research, that we don't have any chemicals that are sprayed that um, are detrimental to the bees in the sense of the fact that if the if the farmer sprays them we and the bees go out the next morning and they go to the blooms where they have been sprayed, those blooms are not poisonous. Where we find bees dying because of spraying is where the bees were flying that day and the farmer sprayed across the field where the bees were flying. If a bee or bees fly away was interfered with um, spray, then you can be fairly confident that the um, Bees will have flown through it, and if they fly through it, they're immediately poisoned, and it's not long before they before they die. Um, uh, Kimberly, uh, so you mentioned that you fed your bees for two days, and the honey locked the nest. Uh, how do you undo, uh, how do you prevent this? Um, so. The bees won't lock the nest. I, I've got a suspicion maybe that you've read something or seen something somewhere else that's, that's given you a, an idea that the bees may have done this. But it, it, I wouldn't say that's the case. If the bees are drawing, if the bees are taking food and they're bringing it down into the nest and, the, and they're filling up frames, um, the bees believe that that's okay to do that. The bees would not be in a situation ever where they're doing destructive work to prohibit the queen from laying any more than she could be. It may appear like the bees are plugging up the brood nest, but um, in fact, they may be positioning it in such a place that's convenient for them to get at it when they need it, when the queen gets to uh, their area. So um, don't stop feeding if you've got crappy weather. Um, if, you, if, it, if it's not great weather, um, you know, don't, don't quit the feeding. Um, the bees will take the sugar syrup first and they'll consume it first. They won't consume the honey, which is one of the reasons why we're even feeding now in our commercial beekeeping operation. Um, we're feeding to get the bees to these lousy days. It doesn't look like we're going to have much of a break of this wet until after the 10th of July, 15th of July. Oh, thanks, Matt, for the uh, question. So, yes, our social media lady actually did make a request before this um, session tonight, um, and we're more than happy to do that. We'll um, try and capture the data um, again here tonight before we leave and pack up, and then hopefully we'll publish it in a uh, Facebook post tomorrow. All right, folks, we really appreciate you uh, coming out and meeting us tonight. Um, Shout out to all those new beekeepers. Hope things are going well. Um, what a crazy year it has been um, uh, between uh, the COVID crisis and uh, the importation of packages. And finally, um, some better weather that we experienced in the early part of May uh, to develop nucleuses, but the, uh, the poor weather and then um, the, uh, the challenges that has brought to a lot of customers, especially for the first year. So. If you can get yourself through this year, you're definitely setting yourself up for um, a good career with beekeeping because you've definitely had a you've definitely had a lot of um, things thrown at you for sure. Okay, folks, and thank you, and we'll look forward to joining uh, with you next Monday night, hopefully with a little clearer weather and no impending storm. Thank you. Good night.